In the 21st century, those who change the world are those who change the culture. They get people in sync, lead tribes, create movements, and generate an energy field where ordinary people achieve extraordinary results. I'm Aga Bayer, and this is the Culture Lab podcast where you will find ideas and inspiration on how to harness the power of team and organizational culture. I talk to leadership thinkers, culture experts, entrepreneurs, and all sorts of movers and shakers. And together we explore the fascinating topic of culture, leadership, and personal growth. If you like what you hear, subscribe to the podcast on iTunes. Or better yet, write a review on iTunes and share the podcast with your followers and friends on social media. For more, check out our archive at www.agabayer.com slash podcast. Hello, and welcome to episode number 30. Believe it or not, we have listeners from over 50 countries, so I realize that not all of you will be celebrating Christmas, but a large chunk of culture lovers are, and so this is the last episode before holidays, and we wanted to produce something really special for all of you, and we created the Best Bits episode. So basically, I listened to the latest episodes, uh, nine to be precise, and I picked my favorite bits. And we had an incredible lineup of guests from Rahaf Harfush, Sue Black, Kate Kearns, Gary Ridge, Wendy Smith, Patti McCord, Kip Lambert, Dave Ulrich, and Aisha Bissell. And it was really, really hard to decide what to include. I don't know if you've heard of the phenomena called decision fatigue, but if not, I just want to say it's real and it can bring you down like a flu. And, you know, there were people like Steve Jobs who wore the same clothes every day to limit the number of decisions they take daily to conserve the energy for the important decisions that they had to make. And now I sort of get that. And I think that I will have to wear a black turtleneck for the rest of the month just to recover from this episode. Um, Okay, so let me tell you what I discovered in the process of re-listening to episodes 21 to 29. First, I think that a lot of companies miss a really important point when it comes to their culture. And that point is, what do our customers need? What is the promise that we make to them? And how can our culture help us deliver on that promise? This is what Dave Ulrich calls creating culture from the outside in. And what Patti McCord illustrates beautifully, talking about Netflix and how it became such a success story. Culture for me, and I'll say it quickly and give an example. Culture is the identity of the firm in the mind of our key customers made real to our employees every day. So, Culture is not values, norms, patterns, behaviors inside the company. It's an identity of the firm in the mind of our key customers made real to our employees every day. So Amazon is one of the firms we've just studied. Almost everyone I know around the world has bought from Amazon. They own 20% of global internet sales. Why do I as a customer go on Amazon to buy, to buy your latest book or my book or whatever? They're fast. They're easy. They're they're dependable, they're predictable. I'm, I'm on Amazon Prime, I'll get the book within 24 hours. Yes, 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 yes. What do you have to do inside to make that happen? Are you loose or are you tight in terms of decision making? You're very tight. Are you unstructured or structured? You're very structured and very disciplined. Amazon's internal culture in their distribution system Amazon services is very structured because that's what gives me the customer what I want most. That's the identity of the firm in the mind of our customers. I want to get from Amazon this product quickly, relevant as quickly as I can. Made real to every employee. I hire people. I train people to make that culture real every day. So I'll say it again. For me, culture is the identity of the firm in the mind of our key customers, made real to our employees every day. By the time um, we were in the video streaming business, you know, getting our toes wet, 
we Mm -hmm. already knew there would be the phenomenon of binge watching because on DVD recently in the last few years before we switched over to video, um, people have been releasing box sets of television shows and people were crazy about them. And we couldn't buy, we couldn't afford very much. You know, we couldn't afford all those expensive movies. God. (laughs) <laughs> so, so, but we had enough information about how people watched. So I would say that's the other thing was we paid, we were so completely obsessed with our customer. And I think that's something that we're able to do now in companies around the world that we haven't always been able to do. I think this is a huge fundamental change in thinking about the way we work because in the old days, and I'm not even, I'm talking 40 years ago or yesterday, depending on how you think about it and what company you work in, you know, only the executives knew stuff that, you know, to make good decisions. And now that information is available very in a in a broad swath to any of us Mm -hmm. like somebody asked me about you know um the future of tech companies or something the other day and i said well what it what's who's not a tech company correct yes right i mean is there a company (laughs) that doesn't have a you know an internet presence at all anymore i mean Nonprofits are tech companies, right? Yeah. So, I mean, even that nomenclature, you know, even the words we use around it are kind of passe or, change, or yes. changing very quickly, right? That's my point, mm-hmm. it's changing very quickly. So I think that yeah. the, the, part of the secret of the DNA of Netflix is available to any company right now, which is obsession with the consumer, obsession with the the whoever it is is on the un, other end of your service or your product. So Patty mentioned how technology enables us to have this visceral connection with our customers today. And I asked one of my guests, Rahav Harfush, a digital anthropologist, how she views the role of technology in the future, particularly in relation to culture. And this is what she said. You know, it's funny because I think it's less about the technology. I think it's less about the technical piece and it's more about the people-centric value piece. It's about the strategy and your values as an organization as to what you believe the value that talent brings, how you want to cultivate that talent, how you see talent, and what your attitude is towards your people. Because you can have five different companies that are using the same tool but mm-hmm. they can use it in five different ways depending on mm-hmm. what's most important to them. So it's kind of counterintuitive, but even though we're getting more technologically advanced, I would actually say it's more important now than ever to stop and make yeah. sure that you really understand what your values are. And if you're a company that values, you know, we value people, we value, um, you know, we value equality, we value everyone has these mission statements. You need to understand mm-hmm. that the data, it's not just about like, productivity. The data is about, okay, well, are you doing equal pay parity? Are you covering healthcare costs? Do you have maternal and paternal leave? Are you, it's not just about having a very fancy mission statement and fancy technology. It's how is the information that you're getting from that technology enabling you to put policy in place and actually reflect your values. So you could argue that as opposed to Dave Alric, uh, Rahaf expresses this pretty inside out view on culture, arguing that being clear about who we are and what we stand for as a company, including our values and purpose, are more important than ever. And here is Gary Ridge, the president and CEO of WD40, talking about the importance of purpose. Our job is to make sure we create an environment where our tribe members wake up each day inspired to go to work, feel safe while they are there, and return home at the end of the day fulfilled by the work they do, feeling they have learned something new and contributed to something bigger than themselves. That's the definition of our purpose, which is people in life today in the world are looking for purpose. You know, if you look about the the workforce of the future, it's not just about the goal. It's what am I doing that's making a difference? What's my purpose? And, um, and that's what's so important to us. 
So we've had this point of view that we should be building culture from the outside in. And we've had this point of view that we should be building it from the inside out. And by now you probably wonder, okay, so which is right? And I wouldn't be surprised if this is the thinking process that's happening in your mind at the moment, because this is the way we are wired. When we are presented with two seemingly opposing ideas, we feel this really, really strong urge to pick one. But Professor Wendy Smith suggests that there is a third way, and she talks to us about paradox mindset and how to implement it in our daily life and at work. You know, when I teach leadership, I say the one thing that I hope you get out of this, and this is at the MBA level, at the executive level, is leadership is about vulnerability. And mm. that's really, really, I mean, this is where leadership is not a textbook uh, learning. It's mm. about living in that uncertainty and that vulnerability. We, um, yeah. we did some uh, work interviewing Paul Pullman. So Paul Pullman's the CEO of uh, Unilever. And um, mm. as some of your particularly European listeners might know, right, Unilever is the large packaging company, right? So they've got ice creams like Wall ice cream and Ben and Jerry's ice cream, and they have Dove soap and Axe shampoo. And Paul Pullman set out a very uh, progressive sustainability plan that has to do with reducing their carbon footprint, that has to do with creating new uh, innovation to be able to, to um, provide products to the bottom of the pyramid to improve mm -hmm. their health and well-being. And when his managers come to him and say, you know, Paul, this is nice and good, but do you want me to manufacture in a cost-effective way or do you want me to manufacture in an environmentally sustainable mm -hmm. way? His answer is yes. Yes. Right? <laughs> and yes, so that both. probably drives them absolutely crazy, but it forces them to really drill down to, okay, well, now we've raised the question. Yes. How do we do both? Let's develop new processes and practices to think about that. So when it comes to thinking about this, what our research has shown, so we have, um, we, we developed what we called a paradox mindset measure. And, and the first piece is, uh, are people aware of the tensions? And so are they acknowledging the tensions? Some people are just willing to avoid them. And then do they have the capabilities to emotionally engage with these tensions? So what we know from research is that one of the reasons that we ask an either or question is because asking a both and question can lead to a ton of uncertainty. It's really, we're really uncomfortable with uncertainty in the world. We just don't want to deal with it. We want clarity. We want specificity, particularly if we're dealing with other people, we need to be clear for them and specific for them and either ors make a decision and are much more specific than let's leave things open to a both and. Um, so are we willing to live in that uncertainty, that, that discomfort in the ambiguity. Um, and then the other piece is uh, how we structure our thinking around it. And so we talk about the processes, these sort of dual processes, so maybe paradoxical processes to manage paradox that has to do with both pulling apart the options and bringing them together. So we talk about separating and connecting or differentiating and integrating. The pulling apart is you really need to understand what each of your alternative options look like. You have to drill down and get some specificity first, and then you have to be able to find the synergies, linkages, places where they connect. So, you know, what does that look like? If, if I'm going to unpack my own decisions about being an academic or being a practitioner, well, if I just leave it at that, then I have to make a choice about what job I'm going to have, what career I'm going to have. But if I unpack what it is that I'm excited about in the world of practice, where I'm excited about impacting people's worlds and making a difference in the world and really connecting with people. And I'm excited about what it is about academia. I'm excited about new ideas. I'm excited about teaching those new ideas. I'm excited about uh, research researching those new ideas. Then I can unpack what each of these are about and find deeper linkages between them. And so in the world of of, of leaders that have to deal with these kinds of tensions, like the existing world, innovation world tension, the question is, what is what do we know about the existing world? What resources, what skills, what reward system, what goals? And what do we know about the innovative world, the resources? And how are they different from one another? Let's just not mush them into one 
you know, overall general leadership, let's pull them apart. And then let's find the really specific linkages, ways that they connect with one another. And so this notion of pulling apart and bringing together is a way to deal with, to cognitively work through these paradoxes. And in, in some ways, we can contrast it with this either or trade-off thinking. What we tend to do is we tend to pull things apart, find the ways they're different, and then choose. It's like make the big pro-con list or analyze, and then come to a decision and choose. Whereas this sort of separating and integrating, I, I think the third piece about it is leaving the choice to be a little more dynamic. You had asked earlier about this dynamic equilibrium idea that we we suggest. Um, you know, one of the things that we know about paradox is that um, it's not about making a choice, sticking with it, and and being stuck in that choice. We like to say it's about choosing. So what does that mean? It means it means that uh, you know if I'm if I'm in the world of trying to negotiate work life demands, and this is the world where we do this all the time. Sometimes I'm focused on what life demands of me, my family, my you know uh, hobbies, life outside of work. And sometimes those things have to be put on hold to focus on what work demands of me. But I'm not making an overall choice that it's just one or the other. I'm sort of fluidly moving between them. And uh, so the metaphor that we sometimes use for this is uh, thinking about a tightrope walker, right? In order for a tightrope walker to go straight and to stay focused, they are constantly in this dynamic balancing between left and right. Or, you know, those that not everyone's walked the tightrope, we could think about riding a bicycle, right? Like to go forward, you're constantly in this sort of nuanced dynamic balancing. But it's not these like massive shifts from one to the other. It's these sort of micro shifts that allow you to hold on to both ideas at the same time. I think that really great leaders and companies with healthy cultures manage paradox really well. They focus on building culture from the outside in and from the inside out. They are people and task focused. They take decisions using logic and emotions. And what I often see is that they take one value and ask themselves, if this is one side of the coin, then what is the other? Or if this is the yin, then what is the yang? And how can we shift our mindset so that we start seeing these seemingly opposing values as what they truly are, interdependent ones that can actually support each other? And a perfect example is the culture of freedom and responsibility. Here is Patti McCord again. You know, I think that all of us have had the concepts of freedom and responsibility separately before, right? Uh, we call freedom empowerment, right? That we can grant it to you uh, as if you're a slave and you're granted to be free. But the idea of being free to make your own decisions at work is something I think that we've all longed to have. And the idea of responsibility is that somewhat old-fashioned notion of, you know, being a good citizen and uh, following through on your commitments and, uh, you know, showing up on time, whatever it is. And I think the magic was that we put it together. And that took lots and lots of conversations. And it came out of the part where... Um, we had gone public. Uh, we were a real company. We had real revenue. Real, you know, we had real a real P and L there, and we were being pressured from our lawyers, from our auditors, from our, you know people inside to grow up. Right? It was time time for that rule book. Time to publish that handbook. It was time for those policies and procedures that real grown up companies had. I used to work for one of those companies. <laughs> we, we all did, right? We all have, right? Um, and I have too. I mean, when you did your litany of my bio, I, can't, I think about, you know, I started at a company of like 150,000 people. And I used to say at Netflix, next one, I guess, is going to have to be just me. And it is. <laughs> so, Love it. But, but, but what we were trying to do was say, could there be a way that we could work and, and still keep that excitement um, and that motivation that happens in an early stage startup and yet do it in an organized and planful way that an adult 
you know, for-profit uh, organization has to do. And so we had been talking a lot about, you know, we want grown-ups who are smart, who want a lot of freedom. And and yet there was that tension. And what we decided to do as an experiment was, what if we don't make it a tension? What if we just make it two sides of the same coin? Which is, you can have all the freedom you want as long as you realize you're responsible for delivering a great, you know, a great service to our customers. On episode 24 and 27, I had an opportunity to learn how great CEOs and chief culture officers view the cultures of their companies. Kip Lambert, the Chief Culture Officer at Destinations, and Gary Ridge, the President and CEO of WD40, describe what their company culture is all about. Really, the foundational principle of our culture is kindness. Um, kindness is our hallmark. Um, we just definitely believe in the dignity and individual worth of just everybody we encounter, not just in the office, between ourselves, but the way we treat people on the phone, the way we interact with our customers, vendors, uh, it has to have a level of kindness. And, and we, we drill this down and in our training, we, we try to help people understand kindness sounds like one of these soft, cushy little things that nobody ever really follows. But we back that up with you know, what does kindness really mean? You know, kindness is respect, meaning we care about other people's opinions, their obligations in life, their family. You know, we speak to, we seek to be able to, sometimes we have to say a hard thing to somebody. If somebody lets us down, we have to be able to come from a place where we're able to have the courage to say the hard thing, mm -hmm. but that that person is treated with kindness and consideration uh, when they're being corrected. So there's, there's yeah. that respect. There's the, the mindfulness that, you know, our actions, um, and their results directly impact people. There are attributes of tribal that are very important. Um, tribal to us is not just a word. It's a tribes are a definition um, of a, a group of people. In fact, Sebastian Junger in a book said that the earliest and most basic definition of community of tribe would be the group of people that both help feed and defend. And our tribe is about caring. Um, if you're a WD, a WD40, we care about you. And care is not just, you know, the hug on a Friday or singing Kumbaya. Caring is about ensuring that we have a, a servant leadership point of view that means we have to both be leaders and servants. Um, and the leader's role is making sure we have a robust strategy, that we have a good business plan, that there's relentless execution, all the things that, you know, leadership support important. And servant is then turning that around and saying, and our job as the leader is to serve our people to accomplish that. So the first pillar is, is one of care. The second one is, is, is the pillar of candor. And to us, candor is very simple. No lying no faking, no hiding. Most people I've come to believe over life don't lie, but a lot of people fake and hide. Yes. Um, so I think there's three. And then accountability, we're going to hold each other accountable. Accountability is not a one-way street. And then, of course, responsibility, the word of being responsible for who you are and what you do. So those are the foundations that our tribal culture sits on. So I'm, I'm curious, why do you think in so many companies and in so many contexts, people fake or hide? They're afraid. Um, it's fear. A great friend of mine, Tracy Fenton, uh, has an organization called World Blue. And, um, and she has, uh, she's really focused on democracy in an organization, but she focuses also on what would you do if you weren't afraid? And a lot of times we're afraid of things that we should never be afraid of because we've never asked the question. So fear is so much a disabler. That's why we talk about the learning moments at WD-40. We don't make mistakes. We have learning moments. I've never made a mistake in my life. I either win or I learn. 
And I tell you, I've had a lot of learning and a little bit of winning. <laughs> I love that. So let's, okay, so let's unpack that because that's definitely very, very interesting. So could you tell us a little bit more about what are learning moments and then how do you take fear out of the equation? Um, a learning moment, our definition, is a positive or negative outcome of any situation that must be openly and freely shared to benefit all. Why do we call it a learning moment? Um, I don't hear and or see too many people getting enthusiastic, walking up to you and saying, I failed. Mm. It just doesn't feel good. Mm. However, if you really talk about failure or not achieving as being an opportunity to learn, suddenly it opens up the communication. It stops groupthink. It's, it, it gives people permission to be able to talk about things that didn't go quite the way they wanted to go. Mm -hmm. And as long as we don't have a punishment mentality around that, you know, one of the great things about our company is you can make any decision you want based on two things. Number one is you reflect on and use our values to make that decision. Mm -hmm. And number two, you're committed to sharing the learning from that decision, whether it be positive or negative. Wow, I love that. And Gary, it's extremely powerful coming from you because, you know, we had many different guests with various backgrounds. And of course, as you can imagine, it's a podcast about culture. So values are something that people talk a lot about. But um, hearing it from a CEO who has a lot to lose sometimes, because I suppose that sometimes those decisions that were taken based on your values uh, and those mistakes, um, let's call them, or learning opportunities that happened, they must have cost you. Um, so how do you deal with that as a person who at the end of the day is responsible for the PNL and and needs to have shareholders happy and satisfied with the results of the company? Well, I think our role is to build a, an enduring company over time. And if we think that we're going to be perfect every day, we should give up because we're not. We are just, you know, basic, humble human beings bumbling our way down the road of life, bumping into stuff. And we are not perfect. You know, I'm consciously incompetent and I'm happy mm -hmm. to admit that. So, you know, um, I, I, I don't hit, nobody can be 100%. In fact, If you think about the, the the top baseball player in the world, they miss 700 out of a thousand balls. So mm -hmm. I think as long as you have, you see, I think what happens, Agar, is a lot of people take little bits of this and try to hang stuff on it. It's got to be comprehensive. You've got to have a very, very clear um, uh, people tribal culture. You've got to have a very clear purpose. You've got to have a clear set of values. You have to have a sustainable strategy. You have to be a great executor and you have to embrace learning. And if you do all that, the, 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 the combination of all those things will create an enduring company over time. But you can't just have a culture and not have values. You can't have a purpose and not a plan. You can't, you know, say you've got strategy and not execute. You can't execute without strategy. So you've mm -hmm. got to put it all together. And when you put yes. it all together and you are relentless, relentless about the key elements of it, which I just shared, then mm -hmm. over time, you get what we have now. Let me tell you, 25 years ago when we started this journey, I didn't know that that would be the outcome. What we did know is that micromanagement wasn't scalable. And if we were going to take the blue and yellow can with a little red top to the world, we had to work out a way of number one, engaging and setting people free around a structure that they felt that they were safe in. When mm -hmm. I look back today, we can say it works because over that period of time, we've had a compounded annual growth rate of total shareholder return of in excess of 14% on an annual basis. And we've driven employee engagement from low 30s to 93%. Those yeah. two things correlate. They yes, absolutely do. Absolutely. And all we do is sell oil in a can. 
You know, what was really wonderful for me to hear on these interviews was that both Gary and Kip credit their culture for their company's excellent financial results. And of course, I'm not surprised because there's more and more evidence that companies who are purpose-driven and invest in their culture can have cumulative investment returns that are up to 1,600% higher than the average um, of SAP 500. Uh, But culture is complex, ever-changing and multifaceted. And I'm not surprised that sometimes even the most admired cultures trigger a storm of controversy. And this was definitely the case when the Wall Street Journal recently published an article about the so-called culture of fear in Netflix. But even before this article was published, one of our listeners, Red al Adel, asked Patty about the culture of fear in Netflix. And this is what she said. The culture of fear uh, conversation has gone on for a really long time. So I'll respond to it in two ways. I remember being at Netflix one time and this was a, everybody was talking about it all the time. We had done a lot of turnover in a couple of organizations because we were rethinking the business and there were whole groups of people that honestly, what they, they were done. (laughs) You know, they had built a great data center, for example, and what we needed to do was move the streaming service into the cloud. Right. Mm -hmm. So when you're two or three levels away from that, you hear that a whole bunch of people in this organization aren't there anymore. Maybe I should be afraid. Right. Mm -hmm. And we were doing a presentation. It was a quarterly meeting. And one of the product leaders of product had done a presentation on what his team was going to do this year was no longer was it going to be incremental changes. We were going to move mountains this year. We were going to do great stuff. And the metaphor he used was climbing K2, right? Mm -hmm. So we go to the end of this meeting and Reed and I are answering questions and he stands up and says, I don't think you and Patty have effectively addressed the very pervasive culture of fear. What are you going to do about it? And Reed said, you know, you used K2 as a metaphor, like you have to have oxygen to get up there. Mm. You could die. Right. (laughs) And if you get halfway up and there's a blizzard and you go back to base camp, nobody, nobody says you did, you know, you weren't brave enough. Mm -hmm. And he said, sometimes doing crazy stuff is a little frightening. Mm -hmm. Right. So sometimes being bold gets you out of your comfort zone and it's not the right place for everybody. Yeah. Yeah. So, and, you know, and I think, so that's half of it. The other half of it is, I'll tell you another story. I just went and talked to a function of a thousand people in the room. This was a culture event. And so these were the most sensitive people, you know, this is the uh, diversity inclusion people and the or OD people, and, you know, it's a, that group, right? Mm-hmm. The culture innovation group. You and I both know them well, right? A thousand <laughs> people in the room. And I said, as I stood up on stage, Raise your hand if you're in the job that you had when you graduated from college. Unless you're an intern, then don't raise your hand. Mm -hmm. Can I see a show of hands? How many hands went up? Zero. Zero. (laughs) Yeah. Zero. Yeah. Right? So I say to them, wow, you know, that's statistically pretty significant that I walked into a room with 1,000 people who all left school and joined a company, companies that were so terrible. Yeah. That they couldn't retain any of you. Mm-hmm. Mm. Yeah. And how many of you measure retention? Mm. Right? <laughs> like, it's not true. <laughs> we don't stay at the same company forever. And if that scares you, then you can live in that, that you know, place where you deny yeah. reality. But the reality is people move on. We all have lots of different places in our careers. And I think that, you know, the more we can start being truthful with people about a career as a journey, then I think the fear will go away more. Mm -hmm. You know, I think our expectation that nothing will ever happen. um, Or nothing will change. Or nothing will change is false. The other thing, to be honest with you, you know, the Netflix culture was about Netflix. It's not, it was, we didn't write this as a Bible for how to run your company. Mm -hmm. We're just saying we tried some stuff that's different. Maybe you should too. 
Yeah. And it's not the right culture for everybody because, you know, we started this conversation, you and I, how Netflix, for example, has reinvented itself more than once. Mm -hmm. So you should know if you're coming into a company that has a habit of reinventing itself, it will probably keep doing that. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and it, you know, and if you want stability, then government work is good too. And I'm not j being judgmental at all. Mm hmm. Right. But you don't just get, I'm just being truthful. And so, you know, if you're going to go, if you're going to join a firm that's, that has a reputation for being nimble and moving fast, then that might mean that you might not be there forever. In fact, I'm going to tell you, it will mean you won't. Yeah. But you know, it, it actually goes back to one of the first stories that you shared with me in this interview, which was um, what sort of company you wanted to create, which was mm -hmm. a great company to be from. Mm -hmm. um, because that basically takes into consideration that very simple fact of life that no one has a job for life anymore. But as an employer, it's, I think, almost our duty of care to create a sort of company that opens doors for people when they leave. Be yes. Yes. Right. right? <laughs> yes. Yes. You know, and, and oh, by the way, when you said that, that we, we have become a, you know, there's no more jobs for life. There haven't been for mm. 50 years. Yeah. Yeah. It's exactly. never been that way. And we mm. keep talking about the myth. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, back to Jeff's question, you know, if you, if I were starting a new HR organization, a new company, the first thing I would do is tell people the truth. Mm -hmm. So for the time you're here, let's learn a lot. Let's have great colleagues. Let's serve our customers. Let's create something that's going to be meaningful for you. And for the for you in your career, let's create relationships with people that are, that are going to be with colleagues that you'll reach back to. You know, it's like the myth about family. That's mm -hmm. another one. Oh, um, yeah. You know, at that same conference I told you about it, I said, how many of you have ever done a layoff, right? This is HR people. 90% mm -hmm. of the room raises their hand. I said, how many of you have ever laid off a family member? Yes. You know, how many of you have used the word family at work? And, you know, mm -hmm. three quarters of them had. I'm like, you know, see, this is where we get in trouble because it's not true. I have to say that I find this issue of fear really fascinating. When you look at the research data, the verdict on fear is um, pretty clear. Fear is bad, period. But some researchers suggest that not all fears are created equal. James Hayton and Gabriela Cacciotti, professors of entrepreneurship at the Warwick Business School, carried out research that shows much more nuanced picture. What they discovered is that fears related to external threats galvanize our resolve and motivation, whereas fears that are linked to our ability to be successful can paralyze us. Which basically means that you probably want to create a workplace where people are encouraged to take on really challenging, even scary goals, and where they are fully supported by their teams and their managers to achieve those goals. And you want to do this so that they can develop confidence in their own ability to face challenges. And speaking of creating a workplace and workplace culture, I asked the famous designer, Aisha Bissell, how to use design thinking to create a team and a culture that enables us to bring our vision to life. And this is what she had to say. What I've found in applying design process to work and life is that most people think that they're not creative and I've worked with thousands of people in helping them design their work and life using design process and tools. And what I've learned is actually ordinary people, and I call non-designers affectionately ordinary people, mm -hmm. are extraordinarily creative. And the missing piece that a lot of people don't use is having a process. So, um, to bring out the creativity in people and the problem-solving qualities, you need a process. So, um, and that's what we bring to corporations is this very simple step-by-step -step guidance 
that starts with deconstruction, which is what we just talked about, mm -hmm. um, which helps you break the problem apart and see what it's made up of. And that not only gives you a holistic point of view, but also it simplifies your problem because you recognize that everything is made up of smaller parts and the smaller parts are easier to deal with. So then the next step is how can we look at the same things from a different perspective? So that's the point of view. And there are some tools I mentioned, wrong thinking as one of them. Um, we do another one around heroes to um, help people gather inspiration around their heroes around work or life. And mm -hmm. I could tell a little bit more about this, but the heroes exercise is the the pivoting point of the process um, because it connects people with their values. And yeah. once you have your values, you can make decisions and choices. And that brings us to reconstruction, this idea that, hey, you can't have everything. You need to identify what really matters. And mm -hmm. so that's the reconstruction or the convergence piece. And mm -hmm. that is built on a foundation of your values. And then once you have your reconstruction, you've identified your key ingredients, then you express it as an idea. And um, you can express it as a visual drawing. You can, we have people do manifestos, their vision statements, mission statements. And, and out of that, show them how they can prototype their new and exciting idea. Mm -hmm. So but just in a nutshell, those are the steps, the deconstruction point of view, reconstruction expression, and using that step-by-step -step process um, is what makes the difference and builds a sense of um, collaboration and really helps people mind shift. I have to say that I integrated design thinking process in my work about a year ago, and it's made a huge difference to the level of engagement and to the outputs of my culture workshops. So if you are not familiar with what design thinking is and how to use it in work around culture, definitely check it out. And now here is a snippet from a guest who has completely redesigned and reconstructed her own life and who's now helping others to do the same. She moved from being an uneducated single mom living in a woman's refuge to being a university professor who's honoured with one of the highest honours in the UK, the Order of the British Empire, and to being an author and an in-demand speaker. Sue Black tells us what she does when she sees a problem, and it has a lot to do with design thinking, but also with design doing. It's a running tech mums, this organisation. I could see a clear problem, like people in general are kind of a bit scared of technology, think they can't do it. Um, but for me, that's holding us back as a country, you know, a, a, and you know, that holds people back as individuals and organisations back because technology offers so many opportunities to do so many different things now. If you're scared of it, that's all of those opportunities disappear, right? You haven't got them. And so... If you, um, so I, I kind of saw a problem that I feel I want to do something about this to try and get more people to understand the benefits of technology in all sorts of ways. And so started running workshops with kids thinking, so do I want to get kids into technology? Is that the way to solve it? And then seeing um, mums coming into the kids' workshops, feeling very hesitant about having, go, having a go at the technology themselves. Then seeing, okay, thinking I can solve this problem. Then I can solve this problem by teaching mums tech skills, getting them more excited about technology. And that's the way that I'm going to try and solve this problem. So when I've seen those things, I've just done something about it. And finally, here is a bit that I love from my interview with Kate Kearns, an engineer, an activist and a speaker. Never believe that your voice is not enough. And it often just takes one person to stand up and say this isn't good enough or not even sometimes all it takes is a question you know why are we doing that do we really want to do it this way is this acceptable or are you going to go home and tell your family about your day-to-day -day? 
Can you go home and look your daughter in the eyes and say, nobody has died today because of your work or your business? And and what I found is I was very much a lone voice um, nine or 10 years ago. And people would kind of say, don't be ridiculous. You can't change the design of a cab, um, which is the kind of attitude I had on site when I first started as a female engineer. Don't, don't be ridiculous, love. We can't do it that way. You know, we've been doing this for 20 years. And because we've been doing it for so long, people assume that's the way to do it. But you know, as change accelerates, um, it's kind of foolish to think like that. But I think the other thing is to talk to the right people, to ask the right people the right questions, to ask the people, try and ask the people of influence or people who can make change or get the ear of someone who has the ear of someone of influence. As someone, a politician said to me very early on, I said, why is nobody doing anything? You know, I'm going to these global safety conferences with um, very high profile speakers and yet people are dying and dying and dying. Why is nobody doing anything? And he said, get in the slipstream of something else. And so that's what I've tried to do. I've tried to align my cause to company values so what are their values and how does this fit their values and then you, you're on their agenda you're not asking them to do something different one of the questions that i'm most frequently asked probably is how can i convince my senior leadership that we need a culture change and i think that kate actually mentioned some of the key elements in our interview the first one is believe that you are enough. Very often we think, oh, I can't really change it. Uh, I can't do anything on my own. But we can very often instigate change and then others will join in. And this is where the second point comes in, rally the right supporters. Um, Kate talked a lot about finding the people who will be willing to support you. Get in the slipstream of something else. So there might be other things that are really important on the senior leadership agenda and they might have an overlap with what you are trying to do. So you really have to align yourself with what's already on the agenda. Choose your battles. Probably you can't do it all, but you can do the important things and you probably should be focusing on what's really important for you at the moment. The next one was be the change and do what's right. So really role model the behaviors that you want to see and do what you believe is right. And finally, act locally, but create ripples of change globally. And what that means is, I often say, you know, you are responsible for the culture and especially emotional culture um, in the radius of two meters from where you stand at every single moment. So... Take ownership of that and make sure that at least you keep your side of the street clean. So I hope that you enjoyed this compilation. And if you listen often and truly like Culture Lab, you can help us have great holidays by giving us a small gift. Please rate and review Culture Lab on iTunes and share this episode with your followers on social media. This way, you will join us in creating the ripples that contribute to building awesome workplace cultures. And before we go, I have a preview of the next episode for you. Our guest is Lisa Unwin, the founder of She's Back and the author of a book with the same title. Her work is um, addressing the lack of clear opportunities for women to return to professional life after taking a career break. And in this interview, Lisa and I talk about the culture change that will need to take place in order for people to feel supported and welcome when they decide to rejoin the workforce after a career break. Here is a short preview of our conversation. And I think one of the fundamental issues that organizations have to tackle is this question of flexibility and agility and not just around the when and the where work gets done but also how much people need to need to work and how efficient they are because one of the things I notice is that although we've got all this technology around us that is supposed to make life easier in actual fact it seems to mean that people are working 100% of the time people are checking emails in the evening it's dominating and infringing on all of our personal lives. Thank you for listening to this episode of Culture Lab. If you found any moments that were interesting, inspiring, or maybe even game-changing, please share it with someone who'd appreciate it. 
After all, good ideas are meant to be shared. <laughs>